feel a little bit like Einstein's chauffeur when I look at all the people in the room and they're distinguished people and accomplished people in the room. You know, I don't know if you know the story about Einstein's chauffeur. He was sh uh, ferrying Einstein around, you know, sometimes three or four speeches a day for about three months. And at one point at the end of three months of doing this, Einstein fell in the back of the car and just said he was exhausted and just couldn't do it anymore. And the chauffeur said to him, you know, Professor, I've been watching and listening to your speeches so many times, I could give it myself. Why don't, you, why don't we switch places at the next spot? <laughs> and so they went to some university, and of course, they changed hats, and the chauffeur got on stage and delivered the theory of relativity speech exactly on the perfect cadence without missing a beat. And when, when he was finished, a professor in the audience raised his hands and asked an incredibly complicated question. And again, the chauffeur, just without missing a beat, said, you know, that question is so simple, I'm gonna let my chauffeur answer it. <laughs> So I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you, Ed, and thank you all of you for um, coming to this very important event. So um, how many of you have smartphones? Well, get ready. There's going to be six billion of them in about 10 years. And the ones that they're gonna, we're all going to have 10 years from now are going to make the ones we have today look like Motorola briefcase phones that we were carrying around 15 years ago. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because this is going to change everything. Does anybody recognize this slide? The here square during the Arab Spring in Cairo, the first iteration of the Arab Spring in Cairo. So uh, during that protest, many people, many Egyptians were following the protests online. Uh, there were many people using social media and technology to get the message about the protests out, to organize prote uh, the protesters using Facebook and Twitter, but many many Egyptians were, were basically at their homes online. And at some point, Mubarak ordered Vodafone to shut off the internet in Egypt. And as a result, many of those people the same, same, did the same thing we would have done if the internet or electricity was shut off in New York, went out onto the streets, swelling the protests beyond what they were already uh, achieving. And at that point, a, a, a blogger and an, an academic who's part of the personal democracy community, the one that I helped uh, organize, tweeted a great, uh, or I'm sorry, posted a great blog post where he stated, you can shut off the public internet, but you can't shut off the internet public. And what, I'm, what I'd like to try to share with you this is the notion of the internet public is a new type of human being that for, the, for whom the internet is central to their lives, either economically, spiritually, culturally, politically, even emotionally. And it's not just generational, although it does skew younger. This is a, a phenomenon that is occurring across the planet, and you can see evidence of it in the act of protests in Europe, the populist protests in Israel, the Coney 2012 phenomenon that occurred last year, the Susan G. Komen Planned Parenthood battle, and even in China where you think that the security apparatus would prevent the internet public from having a voice, when Chen Guangchen was fighting for his release, hundreds of thousands of Chinese posted pictures of themselves wearing sunglasses on the internet. And we even see it in Gangnam style. I mean, a billion views, it's a cultural phenomenon. Whether you like Gangnam or not or can do the dance, something has changed. But you can also see it in evidence, uh, evidence here. And this is, I'll tell you a quick story firsthand. I happen to chair something called the New York Tech Meetup, which is a 30,000 member organization uh, representing mostly the startup community, but people interested in technology. Our organization grows by about 250 people a week. And back on January 18th, 2012, we participated in a protest for what was known as the SOPA and PIPA bills, which you may have heard about. And uh, we went to Senator Sch Schumer's and Gillibrand's offices on Third Avenue to show our displeasure at the fact that they were sponsoring those bills. We sent one email to our membership, and 3,000 of our members came to that protest. But what was interesting was what happened afterwards. Senator Schumer called us up and said, I've never seen that many people come to a protest that didn't arrive by bus. Could someone please explain this to me? And he asked for 
a gathering of 20 of the leaders from the tech community to get together with his senior staff. And he said, uh, quote unquote, I understand that you've created a new political currency that has nothing to do with money per se. I want to learn how to harness this. I want to learn how to, to uh, use these technologies. And I hope that you will learn to trust me so that we can work together to overturn Citizens United and to make our democracy stronger. And since then, his staff has been in touch with many of these same people. And he has not yet called a single one of them. And many of you know Chuck has not asked any of them for any money. Well, let's move on. The internet public has a huge impact on philanthropy, especially in the area of budget cuts. So in 2012, the, the uh, budget for the National Endowment for the Arts was $146 million. But now platforms, not just programs, are being built using technology that are transforming the way we fund the arts. Kickstarter raised, has raised $319 million using a platform that didn't exist two years ago. This is a map of a project called, uh, from a program called, or a platform called Yushahidi. Yushahidi was founded in, in uh, Kenya during their election cycle, I think five years ago, four year, uh, 2007, eight, where young activists were concerned about the government was cra that was using violent methods to crack down on protests who believed that the election was <laughs> corrupt. And they used this map to allow citizens to post their reports of, of, of violence by the government on citizens using text messaging and making that information available on a map. Well, the interesting thing about that project was, was that they built their platform in a way that was open source and allowed others to use that same mapping tool for other kinds of events. And so this is an example of it being used to map the Haiti earthquake, but it's also used for everything from mapping parking spaces during a storm to, to forest fires in California. And is another example of platform philanthropy, not program philanthropy. I ran for public advocate in 2005 on a platform of making New York City a wireless, as the most wired city in the world. And I had a fist up in the air, which was taken from the Tennessee Valley Authority talking about or, or indicating the quest for electricity. And I used it for my campaign poster. And now I see that someone's taken it and given us a sense of what, what I would call app power. Well, to give you a sense of app power as it relates to platform philanthropy, let me tell you a little bit about the Sunlight Foundation and and uh, full disclosure, I'm the senior technology advisor to this organization. Sunlight Foundation is an organization that was founded in 2006 with the sole purpose of digitizing all the influence data that it could possibly find in Washington and elsewhere to illuminate and to empower activists and organizations and citizens to be able to hold their members of Congress and elected leaders accountable. And Sunlight is really a, tr a truly digital platform not just an NGO working at solving money in politics. They are, they are building uh, platforms that allow their information to be easily shared and accessed by thousands of organizations, if not tens of millions of citizens. So this is a chart that shows their, the, um, the, um, the access to the Sunlight APIs. Now, how many of you know what an API is? So API is an automatic processing interface, which basically makes it possible for a server that has a great deal of information to make its information available automatically to other servers. And this indicates how many times Sunlight's APIs has, have been, have been um, uh, utilized and how many times it's been hit in effect. And you can see there's a drop off at the end of last year, which is indica indicative of the fact that the election was over and it was actually more less interest in, in the issue of money in politics. But to give you a sense of the power of platform philanthropy, these are the number of keys that Sunlight has given out to the API. And a key is basically a license or a permission to another organization to access that data automatically to empower their websites to be able to share the information from the Sunlight APIs with their constituency. Now another example of 
thinking about platforms as opposed to, to uh, programs, I started a program in education called Mouse in 1997 where we started wiring public schools to the internet here in New York. And after three years, we realized that wiring public schools really wasn't the issue. The issue was is that we needed to train the students and the teachers how to use the technology that we were installing in the schools. So we developed a program to train students and teachers, uh, actually, I'm sorry, train students to be the systems admins for their schools. And on our board at the time, there was a great deal of debate about whether or not we should start chapters in other cities. And uh, ultimately, we picked a, a, a strategy, which was instead of actually building chapters in other cities, we would open source our curriculum and basically make it available to other organizations throughout the world. And today, Mouse is active, or Mouse's program, the student-led tech support program, is active in 10 states, 20 countries, and 150 schools in New York. And our budget is about $2 million. But we still have a big digital divide. And the reason why we have a big digital divide is that we can talk about how we wire public schools as much as we want, but we're not wiring our students at home. $80 or $90 or $100 a month for access to the internet is beyond the reach of most working class families. And in, this, in the session before lunch, we heard how a third of America's citizens at the lower end of the economic scale are not, ac are not participating, are not having their voices heard. One of the major reasons is because they're not getting online. And one of the biggest reasons why they're not getting online is because we have a duopoly in our country between the telcos and the cable industry that have handicapped and have set us back in order to be able to compete in the 21st century economy. This slide shows the, the we pay the highest rates for broadband in the world. We are about the middle in terms of its speed. And this chart will just show you the amount of influence peddling of money from telcos that has gone into the pockets of congressmen in order to influence the regulatory environment around broadband. We can't wait 10 years for someone to figure out how to get the United States on equal footing with the rest of the world's economy. And we're not, we can't wait for our democracy to figure out how to get to that other 30% of people who don't have a voice unless we solve this problem. I'm very happy to see that the Attorney General is here who has expressed some interest in this subject. I hope that he picks up the ball on this and starts asking some very serious questions which aren't being asked in Congress and certainly not being asked enough at the FCC and other re regulatory agencies. But what about you? So how many people here are concerned about privacy? Your own privacy when you're online. Well, you all texted earlier, by the way. We collected all your phone numbers. Um, but seriously, of those of you who raised your hands and those who you didn't, how many of you have actually read a Terms of Service all the way through? <laughs> all the way, one person, two people, all the way through before you clicked, yes. Think about that. Do you have any idea what you gave away? Our hunger for technology, these apps, they're all wonderful, but we're not taking personal responsibility for what we're giving away. We're not asking ourselves critical questions about that. And the reason I'm putting up this particular slide is because you sh if you want to think about how we're going to transform philanthropy, philanthropy, you'll have to spend some time thinking about how you're going to transform yourself. We all have trouble getting past our past. It's a struggle. I, I, you know, I grew up before the internet, you know, went to school before the internet was born, and I'm still trying to figure out how to configure my RSS feed or my tweet deck or you know, how to log into Twitter sometimes. But I know the technology is changing the equation. And if unless we, as philanthropists, recognize the power of it as a tool for good, it will be used as a tool for bad. And the biggest takeaway I can give you is for us not to think of technology as a slice of the pie. It's actually the pan that's dynamically supporting and changing the way our world works. It's not a bunch of startups. It's not just a bunch of apps. It's a fundamental reordering of the world by the internet public. And if you want to think about how to challenge yourself in your jobs and your personal life, I leave you with this quote by Buckminster Fuller. 
I'll give you a second to read it. The future is yours if you choose it, not your organization. And the future is, is ours if we work together. Thank you very much.